to read from verse 16 to verse 34. <clears throat> and he spoke a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no place to bestow my crops. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down the, my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thy knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Be not anxious for your life. What shall ye eat? What shall ye Ye, what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than food, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, by being anxious, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then are not able to do that thing which is least, why are ye anxious for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothes the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what ye have, and give all. Provide yourself bags with which grows not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart all be also. Then from the epistle to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, and we we'll read from verse 4 to 13. <coughs> rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus, through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think of these things. 
those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last of your cares of me has flourished again, of which ye were also mindful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am in this to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things to Christ who strengthened me. unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness. Covetousness is lust for things. Idols that replace God in the heart and life. This is covetousness. And here we see that the rich man started talking about his goods before he's talking about his soul. But when God spoke to him, he spoke to him first about his soul and then about is good. So this is the, the order. He had no place for God or for eternity, so to speak, in his, in his mind. He, the, the last night he spent, he spent planning for ease, comfort, uh, plenty, and, and pleasures, pleasure of this world. Again, he had no place for thinking of what's to come. Not giving place to God who holds his breath. Connecting this passage about the parable of the rich fool with the parable of the uh, sower, we recall from uh, verse 14 of chapter 8, the thorns are those things which choke, and they are the three things, the cares, the riches, and pleasures of this life. The cares we mentioned, we talked about the last session, uh, exemplified in Martha, being distracted, being anxious and encumbered about many things, these are the cares of this life in Martha. In the first session we talked about, we, we mentioned the pleasures of life in James 4, when they were lusting after things and asking for things amiss to satisfy their lust. In this here, we have the, the, the riches exemplified in this parable of the rich man. One, as mentioned, is covetous, seeking abundance, seeking the wealth that this world offers. And so, uh, as he seeks it, he is completely oblivious to the things that are eternal and to that which, is, which really counts after he passes away. So he's very rich in this world, in the worldly things, but he is poor and bankrupt regarding the spiritual and the heavenly things. If you don't mind, we can read the end of verse 15, brother, where you read. It's very, very interesting. If you don't mind, I'm going to read that in Mr. Darby's translation. I think it's a little clearer. It says in verse 15, uh, Take heed and keep yourselves from all covetousness, for it is not because a man is in abundance that his life is in his possessions. That's a very interesting distinction he makes in this translation because, you know, just because someone doesn't have a lot of things doesn't mean their heart's not wrapped up in the little that they have or the desire to have it. So just because someone's rich doesn't necessarily mean 
that their heart is wrapped up in their things. And, but just because someone's poor doesn't mean their heart is not in that t entangled in the sphere of getting or of having or in possessions. And so it's really important for us. I don't think the Lord is making a distinction here about a believer and an unbeliever. He's just addressing, he's giving a parable. He's addressing the consciences of those who are hearing him. And disciples are there and it's a mixed group. And so we have to be careful of this, that we're, our life is not entangled, as we were talking about, choked in this desire to have possessions, things. And we live in a country that promotes having things in <laughs> a very serious way. So the thrust of what's before us now we're seeing is the matter of riches and that we understand that that is not a part of the kingdom of God, the pursuit of the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God, we must keep emphasizing, is what is in Luke's gospel. It's the pattern of it. And the pattern of the kingdom of God tells us the things that are related and associated with the kingdom. So one of the things here, again, that's, a, that's not associated with the kingdom, is seeking after personal aggrandizement and riches and things of that nature. Uh, life does not consist in the abundance of things which we possess. We're saying the more we possess in man's world, the more prominent we become. But in God's world, that is not the, the barometer that measures uh, true spiritual richness. It doesn't have anything to do with how much I hold in my pocket here on earth. It has to do with how much I hold in my heart in relation to Christ. That's where true riches are measured. With reference to this <clears throat> parable, there is a story in the Bible which is very similar. If you go to Daniel chapter 5, King Belshazzar, he was rich, he made a big feast for his thousand lords, eating, drinking, and worshipping their gods, their gods of gold and silver and, and bronze and so on. And he knew about God from his father, but he glorified him not. When Daniel went and talked to him, he told him that uh, you knew about God, and he is the one who holds your breath in his hand, and you did not glorify him. And what's the result? Judgment came to him that same night. So this is very similar here uh, to this parable. He had no place for God in his heart, so he ended in that way. He was slain that night. <clears throat> I was thinking also that the, the context of the parable has to be taken into consideration because it was as a result of a man who who came to the Lord Jesus saying, Teacher, divide the inheritance between my brother and me. And the Lord caught immediately a drift of where this man was coming from. That his interest was mainly in getting possessions. And that's why he introduces him to the parable of this man who felt that his life was the essence of his life was in having things. And he has to point out to him the danger associated with things. And he wants us, I think, I, I am sure, to get a sense of that as to how do I hold things in this life. You remember again, we go back to Moses in Hebrews 11, how Moses held things. Moses was a prominent man. He had a place of prominence in Pharaoh's court. He could, have, he could have had everything at his beck and call. It was all available to him. But what does he do? In his estimation as he weighs things before God, he sets aside what is natural for what is spiritual. And how many of us are willing to do that? Now, no one is sending us home to go and empty our bank accounts and uh, give it to, away to, ev to all the poor and, and, stay po and stay poor. No one is suggesting that. 
What is being suggested is, whatever I have, how do I hold it? And how do I use it? Do I hold it in light of the fact that, you know what? I can slip away from it today, or it can <coughs> slip away from me. I can slip away from it, or it can slip away from me. If we don't hold it in light of that, then we don't put a value on what is spiritual. First Timothy 6, in light of what you're saying, brother, uh, Paul charges Timothy to charge them that are rich, in verse 17, in this world, or in this present world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God, who gives us richly all things to enjoy, that they may do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So having great possessions has nothing to do with laying hold on eternal life. But living, using those possessions for the Lord in a way, in our lives, evidences that I'm laying hold on eternal life. What I do with what God has given me. God out of the picture, the self is elevated, becomes the center of this man's whole being. And that's why we see that he thought within himself and the eyes and, and what will I do and, all, and so forth and so on. We see a lot of I in here uh, because it's only self-interest. Self-centeredness is what, uh, what a life without God and being rich to God is all about. And this is really a perfect picture of a worldly man who has nothing to do with God. All he has is what, what eyes only can see, uh, what he can gain in this world. There's no faith in, 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 in the things above. And that's, in terms of a worldly man, uh, this is a tremendous success. But of course, in, t in terms of, of the light of eternity is, is a, the perfect failure. Well, certainly this man, as you're pointing out, is a man who has eye trouble. He has a lot of trouble with his eyes. I will, I am, I this, I the other. And he had lost all perspective of the I coming under the authority of God. He's a man that had ruled out God completely because he was sufficient in himself. He saw that everything that he had was as a result of his own personal actions. He would possibly say that the very breath of air that he was breathing was his own. He was not considering for God at all. And so what it leads him to do in the strength in himself, it led him to declare that he was going to pull down his barns because there was great prospect in view, greater wealth. So if I'm going to have great, greater wealth, then it's essential that I have larger barns. So that's the direction he's moving in. He's advancing his own cause uh, at the expense of no interest for God. And God does not sit by and take things like that easily. When he is affronted, when his ability to give and to supply man, and man simply thinks that I did it of my own, God doesn't sit by. You remember Nebuchadnezzar, just referred to it, right? Nebuchadnezzar looks at the kingdom of Babylon and he says, great Babylon that I built. Well, it was at that point in time that God moved in. He says, you built it? I will show you who built it. You're going to go out and eat grass until you declare that God rules in the kingdoms of men. So certainly God always interposes himself when his own personal rights are attacked. One thing we look at here is that 
this man got called him a fool. Think of all, together all things here, as far as this world is concerned. And uh, the value of spiritual life that he should have. It is God's desire that every man should share in that spiritual life. But he gives us a free will. And we see uh, this man here using his free will to reject the God and to gather as much as he can gather of this world and had nothing in store for his soul and to his Lord. I think it's important also for us to see, although the man labored in planting the seeds, it was God who blessed. He had nothing to do with the crop per se. Uh, it is God that blessed the seeds that went into the ground to cause him to have a bountiful harvest. Um, I think it was Solomon who said, All things, Solomon David, all things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have I given thee. We as believers today have to recognize, uh, though we put in much labor into our work, it is, the, it is the Lord who gives us the strength morning after morning, blood flowing through our veins, traveling mercies. All of these things the Lord gives to us, protects us on the job site, brings us back home. We go through the same cycle the next day. And He is the one that blesses with these things. So the man saw where his labor went and he gave himself the credit for the labor but he forgot the one who causes the seed to germinate spring up and bring forth fruit he forgot that one and God as brother David mentioned has issues with those things when man fail to recognize what God is doing in the midst of circumstances yeah, in the in subsequent chapter in Luke, we have the instance of the, of the rich man. And here we have, in light of the kingdom, he's confronted with that, with that issue in Luke 18. And in verse, uh, uh, verse 18, Luke 18, 18, I'll just read the, the circumstance there. Uh, before that, we have the child who's brought to the Lord Jesus, and he says stuff about the little ones that come, and this, these are... This is the attitude, this is what we need to be to enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and in verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, having done what? Shall I inherit eternal life? But Jesus said, Jesus said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one God. Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, All these things have I kept from my youth. And when Jesus had heard this, he said to him, one thing is lacking to thee yet. Sell all that thou hast and distribute it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in the heavens, and come follow me. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. But when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How difficult shall uh, those who have riches enter into the kingdom of God? For it is easier for a camel to enter through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter in the kingdom of God. And those who heard it said, hey, who can be saved? But when he, but he said, the things that are impossible with God, impossible with men, are possible with God. And Peter said, behold, we have left all things and have followed thee. And he said to them, verily I say to you, there is no one who has left home or parents or brother or wife or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more at this time and in the coming age life eternal. And, and so this man, religious, you know, uh, we, we're saying the ones who uh, uh, claim, you know, a certain status or would say, well, I, I do this and I do that, and outwardly maybe present, but inwardly they hang on to some riches, some possessions, some things. And so when this man asks a question, and it's a valid 
you know, what, 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 what do I need to, to do to enter into the kingdom? And then he's, he's, he, he, the Lord Jesus goes through all the things. The Lord Jesus knew this man's heart, and he knew he would answer. Why? Well, I, I keep those commands. I, I, I go to church, or I do these things. So then the response is, well, then fine. Then it's going to be, if you do these things, then it should be easy. The Lord really, and I was, he doesn't trick him, but he really knows that man's heart. He says, well, then that, and if that's the case, then sell all you have. Give it to the poor and follow me. <coughs> and we see that the, this man is very sorrowful because he was very rich. And so here we have someone who has so much that you would think if he had so much, and our brother uh, Joe was saying, where did he get so much from? He neglected the, the, the point that all he has is, would have been from God, or what he would have received was, so to give it up, what is it to give it up? If the Lord wants you to have it, then you'll have it. But the point is, what you have here is nothing to what you will have in the kingdom. At the end of the, of the whatever. What, what is it that you have here? that even comes close to what you'll have in a time to come. And so again, there's the, the, the aspect of putting things in perspective. What is, it, what is a life on this earth without Christ? You know, the focus, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, being anxious and, and, and caring about the focus on Christ. And what is it to have everything? If I gain the whole world, but, you know, what, what, is, what is it? What is those things? If I had it all, but all you need is one thing, that's Christ. And then by having Christ, you have all that you need. And uh, the perspective. And so the rich, so this man had a lot of things to occupy, so many things, so rich. And yet it was so hard for him to give it up. Could we say a little bit about this matter of the soul? I think it's important to, to emphasize that. And just before that, this pulling down of the barns implies the spirit of independency. I have got everything. It came from me, it belongs to me. So the spirit of independency led him on to the expression, uh, so uh, I will bestow all my fruits and my goods in the barn that I built, and I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. So could we say a little bit about this matter of the soul? Brother, is this not referred to in... Uh 1 Corinthians chapter 2, when Paul refers to the soulish man, and a man whose life, his whole life is wrapped up here in this earth, but that's in contrast to the spiritual man, who now has a life in Christ Jesus, who has a life that goes beyond anything here in this, limitate, in this limited realm in which we live. I'm just wondering that word soul, the Lord Jesus in John 10 referred to that he would lay down his life, that, that was his soul life, suke, his soul life, in order that we might possess his life eternal, that he would give life eternal to his sheep. And I'm wondering if, if we don't, if we live only in this realm, if, if all of our hopes and dreams are here, if our existence is here, all that we anticipate is here, we're just simply living as soulish men. We're just living as those who have no hope, really. But if we live in the value and the reality of who the Lord Jesus is and the relationship we've been brought into with the living God, and then that relationship is not a temporal relationship, it's an eternal relationship, it changes our whole perspective on what we possess and the fact that we are now stewards of what we brothers, do they want to make a distinction between soul and spirit? No, not necessarily soul and spirit, but I, I understand what John is saying, which is good, soulish in, in the sense that you've, you, you, you wrap yourself up in things and you lose complete perspective. But I'm thinking of another contrast. The man here is a man who mistakes 
his body for his soul. Because think of his language. Think of what he says. Uh, I have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Does our soul eat and drink and be merry from the natural things? He was building his barns and his storehouse larger, his fruits and everything. The soul isn't going to be able to feed on that in su in, uh, as such. There may be a soulish mentality of self-centeredness, but the soul, the real part of you and me, the essence of our being does not feed on corn and oil and whatnot. So the man mistook his body for his soul or vice versa. He says, soul, eat, drink, and be merry. Now our souls can only be satisfied and fulfilled in what God provides. Not what we provide. So instead of nurturing his soul appropriately, he was thinking that all that I need to satisfy and fill the void in my life is a larger barn with greater wealth in the bank and my soul would be happy. Absolutely not. Our souls can only be happy with life in Christ. And so I think that that's the contrast, one of the contrasts that we have here, where the man totally mistakes the body and the soul. Certainly the spirit was very much absent with him because there was no God consciousness because the element of the spirit attached here would bring a sense of God consciousness to him. He had none of that. He had self-centeredness. So when God then started to speak concerning the soul, it was in a different context altogether. Uh, the man wanted to satisfy himself. He said to his soul, but God who gave man the soul, when he started to speak on the issue of the soul, said, this night, your soul shall be required of thee. Well, the soul is in a different realm. It's in the, we cannot see it. And the man wanted to satisfy that which we cannot see with things that are tangible. And God has, it's a different perspective. The, the conversations are different from when the man spoke to his soul to when God spoke about the man's soul. And one other thing in terms of the, the tearing down of the bonds, um, it would have been nice that he entered into the fact that God loveth a cheerful giver. This is what I will do. I have so much. Why doesn't he give to the poor? Those who have me. But he basically says, my bonds are this size, I'm going to build greater bonds so that I can bestow all of my goods. He had, he had lost concept, the concept of it's better to give than to receive or to hold it back for oneself. Uh, just to connect these thoughts, isn't, I heard a brother, an older brother said to me years ago, I never forgot it, he said when man, when man fell into sin, his spirit fell into the realm of the soul and the soul fell into the realm of the body because man spiritually is dead, dead to God. And therefore God had, has to quicken us, has to make us alive. And therefore, when, when that change takes place, we, man is restored to be able to function. The parts of us are able to function then in the capacity that God originally intended. The spirit part of us is able to enjoy and appreciate and worship God. And the soul is able to value things in a totally different way. And I, I'm just wondering if this doesn't connect with some of this, that this, this man in this parable was simply living his soul was everything. Yes. You know, when you talk to people in this world, you know what they say? It's really interesting. They say we don't have a spirit. We are, we're body and soul. Body and soul. They love soul music. They love this and that, you know? Soul food. <laughs> you know? I hear that a lot in Philadelphia. But, you know, it's interesting. Man doesn't rise above that. Man doesn't seem any longer because of sin doesn't have the capacity to rise above that. It's only when God quickens, God works, that we're able to look up and see above this realm. And look, oh, there's a whole heavenly realm. 
You know, we now live, we take it for granted sometimes. We live in a heavenly realm in Christ Jesus. We can enjoy things that are far above this plane. And that should cause our hearts to rejoice, and it should also cause us to think, if I've been brought out of this darkness into his marvelous light, what response should that produce in my life? And I think in Luke we have this marvelous presentation that everything that we have, we are stewards of. And that's real important in Luke, stewardship. And if we realize that, that everything I have here is not mine, it belongs to God. If I'm not faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give me that which is my own? I think that's just a couple chapters later. And if, if we realize this, it really changes our whole perspective. That even the money I have in my wallet, the car that I drive, the house that we live in, all these things belong to Him. How am I using these things for His glory? But we're using them. I guess. But why do we need more? If if God has done a work, and completed us, right? In other words, if there was a void in us, and that void is filled, why do we keep trying to fill it again? Why do we try to? Why do we seek then riches? If, if we're complete and we don't say as now believers, we don't say my soul, then why do we keep trying to fill it or seek something else? Well, well let's, let's say this. Because there is nothing wrong with a believer seeking uh, to increase in a certain measure of wealth. We go to work, and we don't go to work for free. <laughs> Quite so, right? We go to work with the expectation that we will be amicably compensated. <coughs> and certainly, we would like to be compensated for the job that we do. But this whole matter of seeking riches has to do with where my heart is. Is my heart set on making millions and millions of dollars, amassing wealth, so that I can boast in the fact that this is what I have. This is mine. This is the character of this man. And we have to be careful as Christians not to have this kind of character. Because again, Paul warns Timothy to warn those who would be rich in this world. He's not saying don't be rich. He's saying, how are you going to use what you have? Are you setting your goal simply on getting it for yourself? is a vast difference from having it with a view to using it for the glory of God. This man had no glory of God in view whatsoever at all. He had himself. The thrust was, if I can be the man in Bethesda with all the property in the world, that will make me renowned in this community. And that's what I want. And he said, that's what I was going after. Now, just to go back with what you said, John, in terms of the fall of man, body, soul, and spirit lost its, their, their identic, identity, and they all fell, yes, into one. So that this man can talk about his soul as his body, and he can talk about his uh, soul as his spirit. He had lost all of God's uh, thoughts. He had begun to bungle everything into one. But yes, when God deals with the matter of soul here with him, he says, this day... Your soul, I'm going to tell you what your soul is, the real you. Not your wealth, not your riches, not your body, but the real internal you that has to answer to me concerning why you have rejected my Christ. That's the thing that I'm going to require of you tonight. And you know what? Whose are these things going to be when I require your soul of you tonight? They're going to go to the government or your family will get them. See? Everybody will get something. And yes, the fight, the fight will begin. Okay? So, tonight your soul is required of you. And so we need to make a real assessment of how God deals with things here. So he uses this object lesson of an unbelieving worldly man, this rich man, to teach the disciples something. Mm -hmm. And this is where we can transition to the next passage uh, in, in this chapter, when the Lord says, take no thought for your life. Don't worry about it. Don't be anxious. Don't have these cares 
for, uh, of, of this life that choked the word. But re look at how he sets it up. Prompted by the question about this inheritance, the Lord immediately discerns covetousness and he addresses it in a very powerful word. He says, take heed and beware of covetousness. Hmm. And it's a word I think we should uh, we should uh, uh, we should be very attentive to take heed and beware of covetousness. Because the believer as well in this world can fall into this trap and it can choke the word. And so he uses a clear illustration of this parable of the rich man to move them towards don't worry. And the question now is, okay, if I'm not to worry, why not? Who's going to worry? Who's going to care about this? Uh, what am I to do about all these things and all this uh, pressure to move on in life, to get educated, to get a good job, to move along, to provide, and so forth. And so, in a simple answer, just for the next passage, what I see from it is when he says, don't take no thought for your life what you shall eat, neither for the body what you shall put on. It's because God cares. And this is exactly up to this is, the, remember the accusation of Martha. Mm -hmm. Do it thou not care? Dost thou not care? God cares. And so here he, he, he brings out, God feeds <coughs> them, the race. <coughs> also we see, in, that's in verse 24. And God clothes the grass, 28. What are you going to put on? He clothes the grass. And it has more glory than that of uh, of, uh, of even of, of Solomon. And then we see also a wonderful <coughs> verse in 30, your father knoweth. Not only God, but thou that we bring in the special relationship of those who are his own, those who are born of God, those who have power to become children of God, those who have come by the way, the only way, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, his son. No one comes to the father except through me. The Father knows, knoweth that ye have need of these things. So, just a simple answer. What do you mean? Don't worry, because God cares. Now, let me take that a step further, because you're introducing us into this second sec section so that we might appreciate that God would be saying to us from the first parable, the man was so excessively concerned about his possessions, that he went overboard. Now, I don't want you to go overboard. I want you to understand all the resources are in me, in the Father, to meet all your needs. So don't care. Don't worry. But on the other hand, uh, we say, well, are you telling me I'm going to go home and I'm not going to be concerned any, any longer about where my mortgage is going to come from, uh, my clothes, my food. I'm not even going to bother maybe to go to work because he says, I will care for you. So since he says all of that, I stop worrying and now I'm going to simply wait on him. Pretty soon you'll have a lot to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Pretty soon I'll have a lot to worry about. So there is a distinct difference between anxiety related to worry, excessive uh, concern over things and putting things in their right place as opposed to the proper exercise of judgment. He says a man is not going to eat bread if he doesn't work. So if I go home and sit down and say, well, the Lord says he clothes the, the grass and the, the sparrow and, and, and whatever else, and I'm going to sit down and wait for him to do that, then that's foolishness. I must exercise the right type of judgment. But at the same token, if I'm going to be overly worried about things, things for which I have no control over because they're in the hands of God the Father, those are the things that he would say to me, you leave them to me. And there we see in verse 27, 
he called the Lord Jesus called his disciples to consider. Take that on thought. Look about. Think of what I'm saying to you. And this gave me an idea. Uh, you mentioned a while ago the, the fall. And in that fall, man was told to work. He come to the place where he has to work. And in that is that he, in his daily doings, he is to think of his maker also and the path in which he would have him or her to live and serve him. More so when we think of how the Lord Jesus did not occupy here with earthly things as we do. The difference between uh, that portion of our life which is for God and the portion which we live here in temporal order, what it brings to us. I think of how very fitting this whole, these two uh, parables <coughs> and the subsequent one uh, where the Lord explains the whole matter of the Father's care in every way so that we understand that we do not go excessively worrying about things. You know, we are living in a society today that is full of anxiety, uh, ex extreme anxiety. I deal with it on a daily basis in my profession where there is that excessiveness that leads to depression, that leads to all sorts of mental health illnesses uh, resulting from simply uh, anxious uh, ways of uh, uh, engaging one so that we lose perspective, and especially as Christians, we lose perspective of the one who says to us, be anxious for nothing, and that's what we get in Philippians 4. But there is just this realm of anxiety and worry and cares and that lead to deep, deep depressive feelings because we feel hopeless, we're not achieving what we think we would like to achieve. That's why the Lord is allaying the fears and doubts here when he says to them, look at the lilies of the field. What do they do? They do absolutely nothing and yet they're cared for. Look at the sparrows. What are they able to do in and of themselves? Nothing. Yet they're cared for by the Heavenly Father. And he says, well, you are more valuable than a sparrow. So if I'm more valuable than a sparrow and he cares for the sparrows, is it possible that he will care less for me? But it's because human nature is of such that we must always have tangible things to hold on to. If we don't have the tangible things, then immediately we lose all perspective. And then that's what creates the uh, plummeting effect where we fall rapidly because we don't know where to put our, our confidence. So that's why we get the thought of rejoicing now in Philippians 4. Because the contrast to worrying is really rejoicing. Now, rejoicing doesn't mean that my circumstances have changed, does it mean that? It certainly doesn't mean that my circumstances have changed. My circumstances are the same. But what has changed in my thinking is God's resources to meet those circumstances. Could this be why the Lord brings in some of these very intimate expressions in this passage? Brother Elias brought up the one about your father knoweth that you have need of these things. That's a very intimate expression because the Lord alone was bringing in a relationship that these people never knew about. They never could enter into this before the son himself came. But now he's opening up to them a relationship where in, in, in that setting with, with a child, with a father, that child looks to that, like our children look to us who are fathers. And I mean young. When they get older, they think they know a little bit more. But when they're young, they look to a father with absolute dependence and complete confidence. 
And unless the father terribly disappoints him in life, which many fathers have done through the centuries, but it's interesting that that relationship is brought in. And then the Lord Jesus brings in another lovely, lovely aspect in verse 32. He says, fear not little flock. This is a very lovely thing. You know, the, Lord, the Lord has a little flock. It's not just a hymn book. It's, it's his people. He loves us. And that word little there shows the intimacy and tenderness of his care for us, his little flock. Because it says, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If he's, going, if he's giving us the kingdom, how much more are these little things that we get fret, fretful about on earth? When the Lord taught his disciples to pray, he told them to pray this way, give us this day our daily bread, that God knew what each of his own, he knows what each of his own needs. And if it's a daily supply, you will not go lacking. Speaking of prayer, just the verse in, uh, in again, uh, Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. You see, there is nothing, and there is everything. Nothing to be anxious for, mm. but in everything, for prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, thanksgiving for lessons given, given before, and for answered prayer, anticipated. This is the thanks. And then the result is peace in the following verse. So it, it, what you're saying, uh, dear brother, is that anxiety is always over nothing. Yeah. Think of it. Mm. Anxiety is always over nothing. Now, think of anxiety from this angle. What is it? It is taking on tomorrow's problems today. And you know what usually happens tomorrow? There's no problem when you get to tomorrow. But I've taken on tomorrow's problems today, which means I've wasted today worrying about tomorrow. And when tomorrow comes, there's no problem. And so the Lord is saying to us here, no need to be anxious. Yes, concern is always an important thing, but no need to be anxious. Now, where your treasure is, where's your treasure? Where's my treasure? The man who we were just talking about, his treasure was in his barns. And he was pulling them down, and he was going to set them up greater. The Lord says, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. And where is my heart? Well, our treasure is the Lord Jesus. And where is he now? He's above. He's above. So my heart so should, be... should be above. Yes. So the two verses in Colossians, actually, which answer to this. Colossians chapter uh, 2, verse 3. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Mm -hmm. We'll go to 3, verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. <clears throat> We're also told to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. You know, it's interesting, I've often thought that the Lord, when he, the moment He took us up in His grace, He opened an account for us. You know, I did that with my children when they were born. I opened an account for them and started putting things in that for them. And then when they became of age, they started to put their own things in it. But it's wonderful that uh, we, we talked about this before, the, the contrast from living a selfish life to now living in Christ Jesus. We now, in Christ, seek to use what he has given to us and invest it in eternity. And so I think we have that hymn in one of the hymn books, Echoes of Grace, is with eternity's values in view. Do we live each day with eternity's values? So do we take what the Lord has given us and invest it in eternity? And when we do, it's not lost. We're not, oh, some people think, oh, I gave that, on, I, get, I have to give this to the Lord. It's not lost. When you give it, the Lord is no man's debtor. <laughs> when you give, it goes, the, all the, there's great interest, there's great returns in glory for investing our time, our energy, our resources, our finances in eternity. I like to connect that expression then of laying up treasure above. If you say that uh, 
the Lord opened up an account for us, then undoubtedly when he did that, he gave us the deposit of a pound. Each one of us was given a pound. And that pound is the knowledge of God. Now, he is not going to add the treasure to that pound. He says to you and to me, go invest it. We are to trade with that pound, and that's where the laying up of the treasure ultimately comes. As I trade, I go to the stock market, the spiritual stock market, and I invest my pound, and it begins to yield a return. And it continues to yield a return. This is the only stock market where there's never a crash. <laughs> it, it will always keep going. And the treasure will keep duplicating. And that's where the laying up really takes place. When self is the foundation or the center, it produces anxiety in the form of cares or covetousness that leads to the riches as we saw here in this parable. But when <clears throat> the, the opposite of that, and this is what I think we want to be very clear about, we're saying anxiety and be anxious, for, don't be anxious, but what's the opposite, what's the cure? The foundation has to be faith in God, faith in his care, because in, 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 uh, in the Luke 12, he says, O ye of little faith, why are you worrying? O ye of little faith. When faith is not being exercised, uh, then you have a groundwork for, for doubts and for anxious thought. But where faith is there as a foundation, uh, it should produce prayer. And that's really the cure and how to combat, combat anxious thoughts, isn't it? If you don't, if you don't think about anxious, if you are not anxious, what are you going to fill the vacuum with? It has to be prayer, and that's the clear. That's the clear contrast that, that I see here, is, and the prayer has to be based on a laid on a foundation of faith in God, not only in the God of the raven and the God of the grass because it's His creation, but in the Father. The distinction there is the father of his own. We, he's our father, so the father cares. As, uh, and, and so it should produce within us, faith should produce prayer and requests to God to fill the vacuum that would otherwise be occupied by anxiety. Good brother, couple with that prayer, praise and thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we get in Philippians. Yes. An attitude of thankfulness, because that's the... One of the first things that left man when man fell, neither were they thankful, it says in Romans 1. So one of the first things that should accompany us as believers is thankfulness, continual thankfulness to the Father. And the fruit then would be joy and peace, as we see in Philippians, mm -hmm. rather than an unsettling, uh, troubled, encumbered with many things. That's what we see here. And also... One other and very important point, as we see later in Philippians, is the word contentment. Hmm. Being content with such things as you have. And not to be covetous in Hebrews 13. Hmm. Opposite is to be content with what God has given us and to put it to use and, and appropriate it as stewards in the way that God will have us. So joy and peace and contentment are ours to have rather than anxiety. As to uh, giving, there's a nice verse in uh, Proverbs, that's in Proverbs 11, right? 24. I just read it. There is he that scatters and yet increases, and there is that which holds more than his life, but his hand is only to one. The little soul shall be made fat, and he that waters shall be watered also himself. Yeah.